Hello everyone, I want to welcome us to another beautiful day, another beautiful opportunity we have to fellowship with the Lord, to bask in His presence. We're going to begin the service again today with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask you wherever you are to just lift up your voice and let's just begin to give thanks unto the Lord. The Bible says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord because He's good, because His mercies endure forevermore. Let's lift up our voice and bless his holy name. Let's thank him because he's a faithful God, a righteous king. He is a ruler over everything. There is none holy as he is. The Bible tells us that he is a covenant-keeping God and he is always faithful to his words. Let's just bless his name this day. Father, we just want to bless your name. We just want to magnify you. We want to thank you for your faithfulness. We glorify you for the privilege you've given us again to come into your presence. We thank you, Father, Lord, because... Of your mercies that knows no bounds your steadfast love that never ceases we lift up a voice to you today to say blessed be your holy name specifically lord we want to thank you for your covenant of peace can we just lift up a voice and thank him for his covenant of peace let's thank him for his covenant of peace which he said will not be removed never be removed from us Father, we thank you for your covenant of peace, which you promised us that it will never be removed from us. We give you glory and praise. We give you honor that's due to your holy name. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your loving kindness and your covenant of peace. Thank you, Father, because your peace, your peace that knows no bounds, is at work even in our lives, and we praise your name for it. We worship you. We thank you. I want us again to, oh, to receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation today as we bask in the presence of God as we bask in his word we receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation we receive illumination that comes only through the Holy Spirit we receive our eyes of understanding enlightened let's receive the illumination of the Holy Ghost upon us today as we look into the word of God father we want to thank you we want to bless your name we give you all the glory and all the praise for your words of eternal life for your spirit that is at work among us today Holy Spirit we turn this meeting over to you today we invite you to come and manifest yourself to each and every life. Let the entrance of your word give light. Let there be transformation. Let there be healing. Let there be deliverance. Let your word change our life today. We say blessed be your holy name, Heavenly Father, in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have prayed. Everyone said amen hallelujah it's another beautiful opportunity we have to bask in the presence of god to bask in the word of god the psalmist said i rejoice at thy word as one who has found great spoil i want us to approach his throne today with the revelation you know expecting the revelation knowledge of his words and with a heart full of expectation i'll take a few minutes uh, to reach out to your friends and family members and tell them that we are live invite them to join in the service you know it promises to be a life transforming experience hallelujah let's turn in our bibles to the book of ephesians chapter number six we're using Ephesians chapter 6 for a text in our series of teachings, and I'll read again from verse number 10. Ephesians chapter number 6, I'm going to read again from verse number 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The power of his might there talks about the strength that he makes available unto us. Verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That term, wiles of the devil, refers to the tricks of Satan, the strategies of Satan. All the different schemes and means with which the devil conducts his warfare. It's important for us to know that the devil is real and he is a spirit being. And his methods of operation are very tricky. And so the Bible is saying we should put on the whole armor of God. Now that's the reason why he wants us to put on the whole armor of God. And by putting on the whole armor of God, he says... We will be able to stand against the wiles or strategies or tricks of the devil. What does God mean by this? He infers that there is a devil and we live on a planet where there is a devil. Brothers and sisters, we live on planet Earth and Satan is upon this planet. 
And as long as we are on this planet, we need to get used to the fact that we are expected to fight. We are expected to fight the fight of faith, the good fight of faith. Actually, when the Lord Jesus ascended up on high, our Heavenly Father told him, he said, sit down on my right hand side until I make your enemies your footstool. And we today, we are the agents of God upon the earth. We are God's battle axis. So God's, God is walking through us. His intention is to walk through us. All right. And that through us, the principalities and the powers will all come to the place of understanding of the manifold wisdom of God. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So God is saying, it's up to you, <laughs> praise God, whether you stand or fall, I have provided for you everything you need to stand. If you find yourself not standing, it's because you've not taken on what I've provided for you. The armor of God is God's military gear. Hallelujah. And these military gears are not physical weapons. They are not physical tools. They are spiritual tools. Now, before we read on here, let me just take you quickly to, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. Let's look at what Paul said there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 about God's armor and God's weapons. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. Hallelujah. I read to you if you have your Bible from verse number 1. Now, Paul, now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... Who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Verse 2. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. Look at verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Did you see that? Did you see that? He said, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Implying that we are at war, but our warfare is not carnal. We don't war after the flesh. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare, or the armor of God that Ephesians is telling us to put on. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not physical. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The belt of truth is not a carnal weapon. The shield of faith is not a carnal weapon. The sword of the spirit is not a carnal weapon. The, the preparation of the gospel of peace or the consciousness of the covenant of peace is not a carnal weapon. All our weapons are supernatural weapons. They are spiritual weapons. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not physical. They are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. Hallelujah. That turns me on because all the weapons that God wants us to take on. Paul's telling us here that actually when we take on this weapon, God walks through those weapons to guarantee us victory. Notice what he says there. He says those weapons are mighty through God. So when we take on the belt of truth, God works with that belt of truth to bring us into the place of victory. When we take on the shield of faith, God works with that weapon to bring us into the place of victory. When we take on our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, God works with that weapon to bring us into victory. Hallelujah. The weapons of our warfare are not canal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want you to notice something here. Paul is saying there are things that will try to exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. We are spiritual regulators. Our responsibility is to regulate everything that happens around us. And we do that using the weapons and the armory of God. It's so interesting here that a lot of Christians do not know that they have a role to play in determining what happens in their lives every day. You know, many people sit down and you hear them saying, well, I don't know why God doesn't want to do this. I don't know why God is allowing this to happen. But this scripture is telling us here that we have the job and the task of casting down imaginations. 
we have the responsibility of casting down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We have the responsibility of bringing sickness and disease under control and subjection to the name of Jesus. We have the responsibility of bringing the devil under subjection to the plan and purpose of God. If we don't do that, the devil will just keep running around like some, you know, fellow who thinks he's powerful. And the reason why he's running around like that is because the born-again Christians, you know, a lot of people are not bringing him down, casting him down, holding him captive, bringing him into captivity, into subjection to the knowledge of God. Look at that. Look at that again. Verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. He says, our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5 now, casting down imaginations and every high thing, everything that exalts itself, every high thing that exalted itself. You see that? Coronavirus, for instance, has exalted itself. Coronavirus has exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Hallelujah. What is God's plan for us? God's plan for us is revealed to us in Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Go over there. I want to read that, that scripture to you. Oh, this would bless your heart. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. This is God's plan for us. And anything that exalts itself against the plan of God, against the purpose of God, we have the responsibility of bringing it down. And for us to bring it down, we need the whole armor of God. Jeremiah 29, if you have found it, I read verse 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Glory, 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 glory. Did you see that? Look at this. I'll read it again. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I know, God says, the thoughts that I think towards you i know the thoughts that i think towards you saith the lord thoughts of peace and not of evil so god's thoughts towards us is the revelation of his plan for our lives they are thoughts of peace he is always thinking peaceable thoughts about us he is always thinking good thoughts about us and the Bible says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. I think thoughts of peace. The word peace is the word shalom. It means a state where nothing is missing and nothing is broken. Nothing missing in your health. Nothing missing in your finances. A state of calmness. Freedom from agitations of life. Now this is God's thoughts towards us. This is his plan for us. So, when anything contrary to this occurs, you ought to immediately know that that's not of God. That must be the devil. Why? Because the Bible calls the devil a thief, and the scripture says he goes about seeking whom he may devour. He, the Bible calls the devil, you know, a thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you may have life. That you may have life abundantly. I came that you may have life to the brim. I came you may have joy unspeakable. I came you may have healing. I came you may find deliverance. Now that's the plan of God. And the coming of Jesus is the manifestation of God to us. Now, Jeremiah says his thoughts for us, they are thoughts of good. You know, they are thoughts of peace. And not of evil to give us an expected end. Hallelujah. His plan for us is to give us an expected end. Now, that's the reason why any thought that rises in your mind, thoughts of evil, any thought of, you know, something undesirable that rises up in your mind, you ought to immediately know that that's not God. That's the devil. If, you know, if sometimes you could be afraid, you know, that, you know, you're going to have the disease, you need to immediately know that that's not the thought of God. And the scripture tells us here in 2 Corinthians that we are supposed to cast down every imagination. Don't let any imagination thrive in your mind. Don't let the devil feed thoughts of fear in your mind. Don't think his thoughts. Don't let his thoughts grow and become so strong that they begin to control your actions. You start responding to those thoughts. Don't do that. 
immediately you have a negative thought rising up in your mind, the Bible says you should cast the thought down. Cast it down. That's how to treat the devil's thoughts. Hallelujah. Let's go back again to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go back again to Ephesians chapter 6. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm telling you, God's thoughts for us are thoughts of peace, even to bring us to an expected end. They are not thoughts of evil. There's nothing evil in the thoughts and plans of God for our lives. His gifts, they make rich, he adds no sorrow to it. And that tells us the reason why we know that a lot of what has been happening these days is the devil. And that's why we're teaching you now on spiritual warfare. You need to take up a fight. You need to back the devil off your yard. You need to get the devil off your house. You need to get the devil's hands off of your children. You need to get the devil's hands off of your car, off of your finances. Don't just fold your hands and think the devil is going to leave. Crying will not get him off your compound. You need to back him off with the word of faith, with the sword of the spirit, with the belt of truth, with the shield of faith. You need to take up the whole armor of God and back the devil off. You need to back him off, knock him backwards that he'll never come back again to your house. Hallelujah. Ephesians 6 says, verse 12, For we wretch not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, Wherefore, he says, Take unto you the whole armor of God. Again, you see him repeating that there. Take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Everybody notice that term, the evil day. The evil day. So that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What does it mean in the evil day? The evil day speaks about the day the devil comes trying to knock on your door. For a lot of people, every day is the evil day to them. They have found themselves surrounded by the devil and demons of different kinds, you know, bringing all kinds of negative occurrences and negative words and negative thoughts. Now, if you have already arrived at your evil day, you need to understand that you need to get up and fight. And the Bible says you should take on the whole armor of God so that when the evil day comes around, you know, you will be able to stand. And having done all to stand, he says, stand therefore. So God is telling you, get up. Get up, well, pastor, but I fell. Well, get up. The Bible says the righteous man falls seven times. Seven times he gets right back up. Have you found yourself falling into the pit of discouragement? I'm saying to you by the Spirit of God, get up. Have you found yourself right now falling into the pit of worry and the pit of sorrow? Are you full of anxiety and fretting right now? May I admonish you by the spirit of the living God to get up because God doesn't want you falling into the pit of sorrow, falling into the pit of sadness, falling into the pit of, of discouragement. God doesn't want you falling into the pit of depression. He says, get right back up. Having done all to stand, he says, stand there for. Stand there for. Stand therefore, having your loins got about the truth. Why is he telling us to prepare for the evil day? You must understand the character of Satan. Let me read something to you again. Again, from 1 Peter 5. I want to read something to you here from 1 Peter 5. About the character of Satan. And that's why the Bible wants us to arm ourselves with the weapons of our warfare, which is the weapons of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, I'll read verse 6, verse 7 rather. The scripture says, casting all your care upon the Lord, for he cared for you. Can you say he cared for me? Hallelujah. He cared for me. I'm telling you, that really suits my spirit. Think about it. Casting all your care. What care? Well, perhaps you have things bothering you right now. Perhaps you have bills to pay. Perhaps you're faced with a challenge in your health. Or maybe a situation with your children. Or, you know, at your workplace, maybe you're faced with a condition or challenge right now concerning your workplace. The Bible says, cast all your care. Cast every single one of your care upon the Lord. Why? Because he's ready to take it off from you. He cared for you. He has already positioned himself ready to receive those cares, you know, if you can just give them over to him. Hallelujah. Verse number 8 says, be sober, 
Be vigilant. What does it mean, be sober and vigilant? It means be watchful. Don't go to sleep. Be sensitive. Be able to detect when the devil is at work. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, you see that? Your adversary, the devil. Who is your adversary? His name is the devil. It's not your uncle. Your uncle is not your adversary. Your boss at work is not your adversary. Your colleagues at your workplace, they are not your adversary. Your mom is not your adversary. Neither your grandmom. Who then is your adversary? His name is called the devil. The Bible identifies who your adversary is. He may be walking through physical tools, but you'll be making a mistake attacking the physical tool instead of attacking the real adversary. Well, pastor, but you don't understand. I've got a very wicked boss. Well, he's manifesting wickedness because he's under the control of spiritual wickednesses. The Bible tells us about them in Ephesians 6. So how do you respond? You don't respond physically by confronting your boss. You get your knee on your knees in the place of prayer and you use the name of Jesus and you attack those devils called spiritual wickedness in the high places and break their control over the life of your boss. That's what you do. That's how you respond when you are faced with someone in the physical who seems to be posing himself to you as your enemy. You don't respond carnally. You just end up wasting your time and a lot of energy trying to fight a battle which is a spiritual warfare in the physical. The Bible says here, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Notice that, brothers and sisters, and you must learn and discern how the devil's how the devil roars. What does it mean? Roaring lion. It means he creates scary situations. He is a, a, a spirit that operates through fear. So he needs to roar. He needs to create a roaring situation. He needs to create a scary situation. His intention in doing that is to bring you down, is to bring you into affliction, is to make you defeated, is to make you so scared, and by you becoming afraid, he can quickly come in. The Bible says, he walked about seeking whom he may devour. So, this is his character. He is going about looking for those whom he can devour. Now, this is what, what Ephesians means when he says, put on the whole armor of God so that you can withstand in the evil day. Now, the evil day in that context is the day when the devil came to where you are. Remember, the devil is not omnipresent. Hallelujah. That's why you don't always feel, you know, surrounded by evil all the time. But there are times where you know the devil is busy knocking on the door of your mind, knocking on the door of your house, knocking on the door of your bank account, and you can you really know that look, this is really the devil trying to come in. Now the Bible says he comes looking for those he can devour. And a question rises up in my spirit: who then are those that he successfully devours? Who are the people that he successfully divorced? And how come, you know, they are able to, you know, how come they, he succeeds in devouring them? Number one reason why the devil succeeds in devouring is when people are not armed with the armor of God. When you are not armed with the weapons of your warfare, you find out that you are not able to stand when the devil comes knocking at your door. Don't forget, the fact that the devil came knocking doesn't mean he's going to win. If you remember Jesus on the mountain of temptation, there was a day that the devil came. That day to him was an evil day. And he didn't just come and started attacking him. No, he came with temptations. He came with suggestions. He asked him to turn stones into bread. He asked him to bow down and worship him. You see, so he came with all of those temptations, but Jesus was able to stand and resist the devil. For if you notice what that scripture says there in Ephesians 1, verse, Ephesians, sorry, 1 Peter 5, verse 9, the Bible says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith. So you are supposed to resist the devil, you are not supposed to fold your hands. And cry, 
You are not supposed to fold your hands and start screaming and talking about what the devil is busy doing. You are supposed to resist the devil how? In the faith. You are supposed to use faith to resist the devil. You are supposed to use the shield of faith to resist the devil. He ain't going to get up from your house by you crying. I'm telling you, some people have been spending a lot of time crying to God. And the devil is still sitting down on their couch in their sitting room. And they've been crying to God. They've been screaming, oh God, the devil is here. Oh God, the devil is here. And the devil is still sitting there. Because the responsibility of rebuking the devil is in your hands. You have the responsibility to rebuke the devil. God is not going to come down to rebuke the devil from your finances. Sometimes the devil can block all your economic income streams. If you don't get up and start saying, you devils of poverty, I command you to back off from my finances. Every spirit that has stood against the way of my financial progress, I command you to back off. If you don't do that, you are going to find yourself struggling financially. Home resist steadfast. I like that word, steadfast. Steadfast in the faith. What does that mean? It means that sometimes you can tell the devil, get off. He may not just pack his bag and run off that same second. You will have to stand firm on your faith and say, Satan, I insist you back off. I demand that you back off. I told you to back off and you will back off. You don't just do it for one second and just expect the devil is going to obey you. Let me tell you something. The devil is not an obedient spirit. He is called a disobedient spirit. And you must learn how to steadfastly demand that he backs off and he will finally back off. One thing the devil doesn't have is that he doesn't have long suffering. <laughs> Hallelujah. He doesn't have long suffering. That's the reason why every time when the demons met Jesus, you hear them screaming, Have you come to torment us before the time? Have you come to torment us before the time? Because they know they can't hold up for long. They know they can't hold up for long. There was the account of the young boy who was demon possessed in the scripture. And the Bible says, that when Jesus came to the boy, the father of the boy brought the boy to Jesus and said, oftentimes the devil casts the boy into the fire and oftentimes in the water. He said, help me if you can. And the Bible says when Jesus was coming, the devil took the boy and threw the boy on the ground. And Jesus commanded the spirit to depart from the boy. The Bible records that after the spirit had torn him, the word torn him there means there was violent vibrations. There was violent vibrations. The scripture records that the spirit eventually departed. Jesus stood there and demanded that the devils in that boy obey what he said. He steadfastly insisted on what he said. And that's what we are doing against coronavirus. In the name of Jesus, we are demanding and commanding you devils behind coronavirus to back off from our nation, back off from our country, back off from every planet. In the name of Jesus, you don't belong to humanity. And by the use of the authority, in the name of Jesus Christ, we command the devils behind coronavirus to depart from planet Earth. In the name of Jesus Christ and return no more. Say good amen. I'm turned on. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's what God wants us to do. Resist the devil steadfastly. In the faith. In the faith. And while you do that, he says, Know that the same affliction are accomplishing your brethren that are in all the world. Did you see that? Sometimes you may feel like you are the only one suffering this, but the Bible is saying here, you need to learn to stand your ground because you're not the only one going through what you're going through. There are people who have been down that road before, but they overcame. Daniel spent a night in the lion's den, but he overcame. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego spent, you know, some time in the furnace of fire, but they overcame. And if you stand your grounds in faith, you will overcome. For the Bible says, by faith, Daniel stopped the mouth of the lions. By faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they quenched the violence of the fire. I believe you can quench the violence of that satanic fire if you stand your grounds in faith. What is faith? Faith believes the words of God, confesses it, and acts as though it is so. Oh, hallelujah. Let me show you a few things here. Let me show you a few things here. Mark chapter 4. 
Max Gospel chapter 4. Thank you, Jesus. Mark chapter 4. I want to show you something here. Look at what the Bible says here. Mark chapter 4. If you have found it, I will read verse number 14. The Bible says, The sower soweth the word, and these are day by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard the word, Satan cometh immediately. Satan cometh immediately. Remember the Bible says the devil goes about looking for whom to devour. He goes about looking for whom to devour. And now Mark is telling us that anytime when believers get turned on to the word of God, the first thing that happens is that Satan comes immediately and take it away the word that was sown in their hearts. Why does the devil focus on the word, trying to stop the word? He does so because the victory that overcomes him is our faith in the word of God. The way we resist the devil is through our faith that comes by we hearing and hearing the word of God. Are you listening to this? Now that's why it is very important for you to give attention to listening to God's voice at this time and listening to the word of God. And that's why you notice when the Bible says the devil is going about seeking whom to devour, one of the first things he's looking at for, he's looking at for Christians who are giving attention to God's word and or who are in places where the word of God is supposed to reach them. What he's trying to do is to stop you from, you know, grasping the word of God, receiving the word of God and, and having that word bear fruit in your spirit. Because once the word of God comes to you, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. That's how the faith, faith in God comes by hearing the words of God. And so the devil pitches his tent and fighting you, keeping you from hearing the word. Sometimes he will do anything he can to get you so busy, make sure you don't have enough time, and tells you all sorts of, you know, gives you all sorts of excuses, and you don't know that what he's trying to stop you from is from you hearing the word look at what Matthew says about what Jesus said here Matthew 13 our Lord Jesus said the sower sowed the word in Mark and he said these are there by the wayside and I want to encourage you to get out of the wayside don't see it on the wayside I'll tell you what it means to be on the wayside what does it mean to be on the wayside a lot of Christians are wayside Christians they are wayside Christians. What do we mean wayside Christians? We mean, yes, they are children of God, but they have, they have not really gotten deep into the reality of what it means to be a child of God. They are wayside Christians. You are going to see what a, the characteristic of a wayside Christian is here from the book of Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 verse 9. Everybody listen to what the Bible says here. It says, Who had ears to hear? Let him hear. Did you hear? Did you see that? He's speaking to people who had flaps on their head. Just like you and I, we all have this flap. But he's saying, who amongst you has ears to hear? If you look at that from other translation, it means, where are those who are giving attention, inclining their ears, Making a determined decision to hear God's words. Are you following this? It says those people will actually hear. It means they will get faith. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. One reason why many Christians don't have faith is because they are not inclining their ears to hear. Sometimes people sit down in church and they get distracted. You're sitting down in church, you're distracted by your phone, you're distracted by the devil. He tells you to get up and go to the bathroom right at the time when a word is about to reach your spirit. 
But you see, those who have ears to hear, it's talking about an attitude. There's a hearing attitude. It's talking about those who have desire to hear. Those who have their spirits inclined and tuned. They are hungry. They want to hear. They don't want anything to distract them. They are like Mary in the house of Mary and Martha, where the Bible says Mary sat at Jesus' feet listening to his words. Many Christians don't give such attention to the word of God. And let me tell you something. That's the reason why the devil is able to take from them even what they hear. Watch this. The Bible says there in verse 10, the disciples came and said unto Jesus, Jesus, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. Why? Because they, don't, they didn't come with intention of hearing. They have not inclined their ears to hear. And it's important for you to understand that if you don't incline your spirit to learn about faith and learn the lifestyle of faith, you will always be struggling. You'll be doing so many things, but they will not be working because nothing works in the Christian life without faith. Faith is the law of the spirit. It is the law, operational governing law that the Holy Spirit uses to administrate life in Christ Jesus to you. The Holy Spirit is the administrator of life in Christ. But without faith, the Holy Spirit can't help you. He is a helper, but without faith, he can't help you. Are you listening to me? Without faith, you can't experience grace. Without faith, you can't taste the healing. Without faith, you cannot sleep soundly at night if you are being terrorized by the devil. You need to understand the importance of faith. And faith does just Faith doesn't come to you just because you are a Christian. Faith doesn't come to you because you have a Bible. You can have a Bible and still be full of fear. Faith doesn't come to you because you are a member of a church. Faith comes to you by hearing and you inclining your ears to hear the word of God. You must understand how important it is to have ears that are itching to hear God's words. Jesus said, who had ears to hear? He's still asking that question today. Which of you have ears to hear? Which of you have offered your ears to God? Which of you are inclining your ears? We spend a lot of time listening to all sorts of things. We, we listen to the words of our friends, words of our uncles. We socialize and engage with people. And all of these people are not feeding the word of God to our spirit. We need a revolution of the use of our ears. We need a transformation in the application of our ears. We need to turn our ears to sermons that will change our lives. We need to give our ears to platforms where the word of God is being preached 24-7 so that our lives can change. I'm telling you, if you can change your hearing, you can change your faith life. If you change your faith life, you can embrace all the beautiful things that God has for you in Christ Jesus. There is an abundant life in Christ. That abundant life is a life of bliss. But faith... Faith is the access to that abundant life. The Holy Spirit is the administrator of that abundant life. But the law of faith is the law that the Holy Spirit ex expects you to employ in order for you to gain access into that room of grace. Oh, my. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Look at what the Bible says here. Verse 12 says, for whosoever hath. Now, I'm going to read verse 9 and verse 12 again. So you can flow out what he's talking about. Remember, he says, who hath ears to hear? So that's the subject of conversation there. The subject of conversation is who hath ears to hear? Help me ask your neighbor, do you have ears to hear God's word? Do you have desire for God's word? Do you have a hunger for God's word? That's another meaning of what it means. Who had ears to hear? How hungry are you for the word of God? How much time do you spend in God's word? That's how hungry you are for the word. We know how hungry you are by what you spend your time on. Most Christians are not hungry for the word. They sleep off when it's time for the word. Most times when they go to church. They love to dance and dancing is good. They love to sing, but singing is good. But you can dance and dance and dance and still have the devil busy around your life if you don't know the word of faith. 
That's why Paul said, faith cometh by hearing. And that's, it's, that's the most important thing in your life as a Christian. Well, pastor, but you know, I mean, holiness is the most important thing as a Christian. Yes, holiness is important, but you cannot assess holiness without faith. How can you become holy without faith in the finished works of Christ? Well, somebody says, well, but righteousness is the most important thing. Well, you cannot become righteous without faith. Your righteousness is by faith of Jesus Christ. Well, grace is the most important. Well, but you cannot assess grace without faith. Well, salvation is more important than faith. Well, you cannot be saved without faith. Faith is the law of the Spirit. It is the law of the Spirit that governs life in Christ. You have no life in Christ without faith. In fact, you have no life without faith. You have no life without faith. Because the judge does not live by physical energy. The judge shall, must live by his faith. So faith is the life of the judge. You have no life without faith. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the words of God. Jesus said, who had ears to hear? Who had ears? Who's ready for faith? Who's, who has ears of faith? He who had ears to hear, let him hear. And then verse 12 says, For whosoever hath ears to hear, watch this, to him shall be given. Do you see that? And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has no ears to hear, and this is the reason why the church of Jesus Christ is facing a lot of challenges. People are more interested in physical things than they are in learning the word of God, hearing the word of God. Brothers and sisters, it is important for you to know that if you are challenged in any area of your life, don't first start seeking for prayers. The first thing you need to start seeking for is the knowledge of what God's word says about that area of your life. We can pray for you and pray for you and back the devil off today. Tomorrow, when the devil comes back to check to see whether you are still the way you used to be in terms of knowledge, he finds that you are still empty. He finds that you still don't know who you are in Christ. He finds that you still don't know the life of faith. So what does the devil do? He goes and brings seven more demons, more wicked than he is, and your case becomes worse than what it was before you were prayed for. That's why many Christians suffer. And listen to this. For those of us who are ministers of the gospel, it is important for you to know that when you minister deliverance to people, it is important to get them into the world. They must learn the life of faith. You must, you must not forget this. Faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It is the life of the just. The just does not live by any other means except by faith. We've been justified by the blood of Jesus. We must live and the faith, faith, when we talk about faith, it is a system. It starts by having ears to hear. That's why Jesus said, who has ears to hear? You must incline your ears to hear from God at every opportunity you have. Anytime someone is preaching the word or teaching the word, you must have a hearing attitude, a listening attitude. You must have desire to learn something new, to hear something from God. During your quiet time, you must have ears open to hear, to hear from God. You must have ears open to hear from the Holy Spirit. Ready to be spoken to by the Holy Spirit. You know, today while I was meditating, the Holy Spirit said to me, He said, Son, do you know that a lot of Christians greatly delight in the commandments of the devil, contrary to what I said in my word? You know, the Bible says in Psalm 112 verse 1, the scripture says, you know, let me read it to you, Psalm 112 verse 1. Hallelujah. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me today while I was meditating upon the word. Psalm 112 verse 1 says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighted greatly in his commandments. 
the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, son, a lot of people fear the devil and they delight greatly in the devil's commandments. Let me tell you how that works. See, every time the devil play, play, plants a suggestion into your mind and you act upon it and you become worried by it and you become afraid, it is because you greatly delight and taking pleasure in what the devil just told you. You believe him and you have more awe, more, more awe for the devil. That's opposite of what the Bible requires us to do as Christians. Why is it that Christians don't take God's word seriously as much as they take the words of the devil? Do you realize when the devil tells you, you know what, you're not going to be able to pay your bill this month. All of a sudden you find yourself depressed. You find yourself worrying, oh God, what am I going to do? And you start saying it, I don't know where I'm going to get money to pay my bills. You are greatly delighting in the commandments of the devil. He just told you in your spirit that you will not be able to pay your bills. You believed him and you embraced his words and you are acting in line with what he said that's not how God wants you to act the Bible says sanctify the Lord alone in your heart let him alone be your fear why do you fear the devil because you cannot believe he's gonna do what is suggested to you in your mind you cannot believe that it's gonna happen that's that's what it means but as Christians we are supposed to greatly delight ourselves in God's words are you there Anytime you see the Bible saying, the Lord is your shepherd, I shall not, you know, you shall not want. You are supposed to take a lot of pleasure, take a, give a lot of attention to it, incline your ear to hear it, and listen, mutter it, believe it, confess it, act like it is so, because you know he is your shepherd, you shall not want indeed. That's what it means to fear the Lord. To fear the Lord means to keep his commandments. To fear the Lord means to follow his words. To fear the Lord means to incline your ears to hear what he has to say. Oh man, that blew my mind. That's what the Holy Spirit told me today while I was in meditation. Does the Holy Spirit speak to you every day? Do you hear from his voice? Do you hear his voice? It's, it's important for you to magnify his words in your heart. Hallelujah. Jesus told the disciples there in Matthew... He said, he that has ears to hear, who has faith, that's another way of putting it. Because if you have ears to hear and you hear the word, then you will have faith. So let's look at it from that perspective. Matthew 13, 12. He who has faith, to him shall be given. Did you see that? So faith is what gives you access to receive. And he shall have more abundance. That's how we enjoy abundant life. But whosoever has no faith, from him shall be taken away even that which he had. Now that's how the devil is able to take away from people. That's how he's able to steal from people. That's how he's able to gain ground. Now, if you look at, if you keep that in mind, Jesus just finished teaching them there about that. And then in that account of Mark 4, <coughs> hallelujah. In that account of Mark chapter 4, we see that the same day, verse 35, the same day after he taught them that he who has ears to hear, he who has faith to him shall be given and he will have abundance. And he who doesn't have ears to hear and as a result does not have faith, even what he has will be taken from him. The same day after Jesus said that to the disciples, when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. Now, anyone who has ears to hear is supposed to meditate upon what he just said. He said, Let us pass over unto the other side. And he's supposed to greatly delight in that commandment. He didn't say, let's go get drowned. He didn't say, let's go die in the ocean. He didn't say, let's go and end our ministry. He said, let us pass over onto the other side. Now, we know whether you really heard what he said by how you act when storms arise on the ocean. And that's exactly what happened there. 
The disciples didn't really hear. Many Christians have not really heard what God said in the word. Are you listening to me? God told us in the scripture. He said, if you have to go through the water, I will be there with you. If you have to pass through the fire, I will be there with you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, lo, I am with you until the end of the world. He said, I am your shepherd. You shall not want. I will make you lie down in green pastures. He said, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. He said, my thoughts are you. They are thoughts of peace, not of evil. Even to give you your expected end of victory that's what God said the question is have you really heard him have you really heard him because if you have not yet inclined your ear to really hear him then you will struggle with faith you will struggle with the devil you will struggle in times of storms you will not have anything to stand your grounds and used to resist the devil with oh hallelujah he said he always causes us to triumph in Christ. He said if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He comes from another realm. He belongs to the realm of the supernatural. He lives in a world where nothing can hurt him. He said when there were but a few men and, and, and strangers in the land of Canaan, he suffered no man to do them wrong. He reproved kings for their sake. He said to them, touch not man anointed and do my prophets no harm. My question is, have you heard him? Because that's what he said. Are you listening? He said, who has ears to hear? Let him hear. The question is, have you heard him? Oh, the Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. That's what he said. He said he was bruised for our iniquities. That's what he said. He said the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes we were healed. The question is, have you heard him? Have you heard him? Are you listening? Many have not heard him. He said he will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not by the economy around us. The question is, have you heard him? Have you heard him? Have you heard him? Because he said, great shall be the peace of the children. Are you worried about your children? It means you've not heard the Lord. You've not heard his voice. And the Bible says the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord causes the hand to carve. The question is, have you heard him? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the words of God. Oh, I heard him say to me, he said, son, your heart should be fixed, trusting in me, for they that trust in the Lord shall be like Mount Zion that shall never be moved. I challenge you to open your heart and open your spirit to hear the Lord today. Hallelujah. Help me ask your neighbor, have you heard him? He's been speaking. He's been speaking. He's been speaking. The question is, have you heard him? Here Jesus said to the people, let's go over to the other side. He didn't say let's go get drowned. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Our Lord Jesus brought us out of the domain of darkness. He translated us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Are you listening to this? He didn't bring us out for us to be defeated. He brought us out to take us in. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt to take them into the land of Canaan. The question is, have you heard his voice? Here in Mark, he said to them, let's go over to the other side. And the Bible says in verse 36, when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the sheep. And there were also with him other little sheep. And there arose a great storm. So that's the evil day. Remember, the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. In the evil day. Because the evil day is that day when the devil comes to knock on your door to say, what about dying today? What about brokerage today? What about going under the waters? Are you listening? There arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the sheep so that it was now full. Where was Jesus? He was right there. Let me tell you something again. God's presence is with us. But faith is the key to victory. Are you out there? Faith is the key to victory. Thank you, Jesus. There arose a great storm of wind. <coughs> and the waves beat into the sheep so that it was now full. Verse 38. And he was in the hinder part of the sheep 
asleep on a pillow. Now just picture this as the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. He is the word of God. When the Bible says he was in the hinder part, asleep on a pillow, it meant that the people neglected the word of God. They let the word of God go to sleep. The revelation of the word of God went to sleep. And every time the revelation of the word goes to sleep in your life, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be full of fear. You're going to be full of worry. You're going to be full of anxiety. Your senses will take over your reasonings. And that's exactly what happened there. He was in the hinder part of asleep, hinder part of the sheep, asleep on a pillow. I mean, how could you have one opportunity to ride in a boat with God manifest in the flesh, the Lord God of hosts, Jesus Christ? Are you listening? And let him go to sleep. And you're not engaging with him. They didn't really have ears to hear. They had no hunger for knowledge. I mean, this is an opportunity to try to learn. Ask him questions. Engage with him. But not these disciples. They were in their terrain where they were used to. Remember, they were specialists in fishermen. They were used to the boat life. And they got into that place of their everyday life and they forgot the word. And that's the problem with many Christians. Many of us are consumed with our jobs, consumed with our everyday affairs, that we've forgotten we've let the word of God go to sleep. Hallelujah. And when the word goes to sleep, fear takes over. And the Bible says, they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? This is what they said. Everybody listen. Everybody listen. Are you listening? This is what they said. They said, carest thou not that we perish? But that was not the word he gave to them when they set out. He said to them, let's go over to the other side. He didn't say, let's go and perish. So what happened to the word they received? The enemy came immediately after they heard the word and took the word from them. Remember the parable of the sower? The Bible says, these are they by the wayside, verse 15, where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and take it away the word that was sown. Why was the devil able to take it? Because they did not have ears to hear. They didn't give attention, meditation. You see, for you to really hear, you need to give attention. Don't allow distractions keep you from really hearing what God said. Meditate upon it until it becomes a rema in your spirit. Until you can jump up and start screaming, God is on my side. I will not fear what the enemy tries to throw against me. Coronavirus, you are under the cause and it is redeemed. Christ has redeemed me from the cause of the law being made. A cause for me for it is written. Cause is everyone that hangeth upon the tree. You know, and you must come to the place where that conviction is so strong in your spirit that there's nothing the devil is going to throw at you. What's going to come out of your mouth is what you believe. Why did they say, carest thou not that we perish? Because that's what they believe. If you listen to the confession of a lot of Christians today, many Christians are confessing so many things that are not in line with the word. They, you hear them say, well, I'd like to be realistic. Now that's your problem. You forgot that you were born again. You were recreated. You were delivered from a people of a strange language. Listen, what you call being realistic is living like the people of the, of the world. The Bible tells us that God brought us out of a people of a strange language. Pastor, what do you mean? We have a new language now. We don't call things that are the way they are. We don't call things that are, you know, the way we see it. We call things that are not as though they were. We don't call things that are as though they are not. We call things that are not as though they were. We look at the circumstance and we say, we have victory. We call victory. We look at coronavirus and we don't deny its existence. We don't talk about his existence. We rather say, he always caused us to triumph and we triumph over the scourge of coronavirus. That's how we talk. When Jesus got up, he looked at them and said, where is your faith? How is it that you have no faith? 
That's the question he's asking. And the simple reason is because they didn't give attention to what he said. There are many things in scripture that God has said that many of us have not really taken time to meditate upon. And I want to motivate you as I bring this sermon to close to give attention to God's word. Give attention. Meditate upon what God said. Get a rema. Get a rema. Get a rema from God's word. A revelation from God's word. And hold on tightly unto it. Don't let the devil beat it out of you with a ball bat. Don't let the devil knock you with it. Don't let the devil kick you away with it. Let it be so strong in your spirit that you can at every given time bring forth those words into manifestation. Brothers and sisters, he said to us in his words that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He told us in his words that a thousand shall fall on our side, ten thousand are on our right hand. But because we dwell under the revelation of him as our heir shall die, no such evil shall befall us. No evil shall befall us. No plague shall come near our dwelling. He told us in his words that strangers will build up our walls. Are you listening? He said he will feed us with the heritage of Jacob our father. We need to listen, meditate, listen, meditate and start confessing it. Start acting like though we are expecting it to come to pass because it's going to come to pass. Just like you are expecting the devil to make those fearful thoughts come to pass and you start acting in fear. That's how God saying start acting in faith. Start acting expecting that he's going to supply your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Bible says, say ye to the righteous, it shall be well with him. He shall eat the good of his doing. The he said, I was young, now I'm, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous for a second, nor his seed begging bread. Let me tell you something. We are the seed of the righteous, and we don't beg bread. We prosper by the covenant of Abraham. We don't beg bread. We prosper by the blessing of Abraham. All these blessings have come upon us. They are at work in us, and they overtake us. We are blessed in our fields of endeavors. We are blessed in our houses. We are blessed on every side. Can you shout amen? Oh, Father, we thank you. We just lift our hands to heaven to say thank you. Thank you for your covenant. Thank you for your armor. Thank you for faith. Thank you for grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Father, we just want to say thank you. Wherever you are, I want you to make this confession after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I receive, I receive your word of promise. Your word of promise. I believe, I believe. You are my God. You are my God. You are my shield. You are my shield. And my exceeding great reward. And my exceeding great reward. Say this after me. Say my heart is fixed. My heart is fixed on your promises. On your promises. Therefore I shall not be afraid. Therefore I shall not be afraid. Of evil tidings. Of evil tidings. I rise to the top. I rise to the top. I excel in my career. I excel in my career. I am the head. I am the head. I can never be the tail. I can never be the tail. I am the seed of the righteous. I am the seed of the righteous. I don't beg bread. I don't beg bread. My God supplies. My God supplies all my needs. All my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. By Christ Jesus. And if you are out there and you've not made Jesus the Lord of your life, it's important to make that decision today. Or if you are backsliding and you want to rededicate your life to Christ, you should do that. I'd like you to just say these few words after me. If you would like to rededicate your life to Jesus, or you want to be born again, can you say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I receive you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray for you that the gift of righteousness will be administrated to you now. I pray that the Spirit of God will recreate your human spirit and you are born again as your sins are remitted in Jesus' name mighty name amen and amen now if you have an offering we're going to just pray over the offerings as we close the service the bible says we should give and it shall be given unto us good measure pressed down shaken together running over our god gives into our bosom that's how we live 
He said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, and I will cause the windows of heaven to be opened unto you, and I will pour blessings on you such that there will be no room to hold it, even in the time of hardship. So if you have your tithes and your offerings, we're going to pray over it in the name of Jesus. We activate our faith and we pray over the tithes and the offerings in Jesus' name. We we'll declare the blessing upon every giver. We call the manifestation of the hundredfold return to come to you. And as you offer your tithe to the Lord, we declare in Jesus' name, abundance upon your house. The peace of Melchizedek connecting. To you through the tides, we call it into manifestation in your life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, God bless you richly. You can use our church banking details. If you're a member of the House of Diplomacy Assembly, you know, to give your tithes and your offerings. And, you, or, you know, or you can send us a message if you'd like us to send you the banking details. And we'll be very delighted to send you the banking details. Those of you that are on the mobile app, you can use the give button on the mobile app. You know, to take you to our PayPal checkout page where you can give whatever amount of offering you want to give. It is important to give at this time because in the time of famine, a very important thing that happened when a plague came upon the land of israel the bible tells us that david crossed that plague by making a sacrifice at around now stretching floor and this time where there's coronavirus around the world one of the things you should be praying and prayerfully doing is putting sacrificial seeds into the ground of the spirit sowing into the work of god and expecting victory in every area of your life well Pastor Emmanuel Ogbete here saying, I love you all. Have a great day. God bless you richly. And bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for today's service. We encourage you to be a doer of the word you have heard. We pray over your tithes and offerings today. We pray that God will multiply them as you give them to the Lord in Jesus' name. You can use any of our church banking information to give your offerings. Remember to download our mobile app called DRM Live from the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. God bless you richly.